My name is Lila, and tonight we will be exploring the universe. For my presentation, I will be going over the Big Bang, satellites, the universe, and more. Did you know that scientists think the Big Bang happened 3.4 billion years ago? That's what we will talk about first. Does anyone know what the Big Bang Theory is? No, I'm not talking about the TV show. In science, Many people believe the Big, Bang, the Big Bang was practically the birth of everything. Scientists think that the universe was contracting, then it exploded with a bang like the name describes. Scientists that study space are called astronomers. They want to dig deeper into space, but they cannot exactly do that without pictures. That's why the Hubble Space Telescope and other satellites were created and sent to space. While I was researching, I came across a website that talked about the Big Crunch. The Big Crunch is what astronomers think might be the end of the universe. Even if that happens, none of us here would be alive to experience it. The Big Crunch. The Big Crunch is what people think will happen at the end of the universe. After the universe has finished expanding, scientists think it will start to contract and end with a crunch. Sci experts say that the Big Bang could happen again, as well as the Big Crunch, and keep going on and on and on forever. This is just a theory though, so it could possibly not happen. NASA. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, is the most popular space company. It was founded by President Dwight D. Eisenhower on July 29, 1958. Since then, NASA has made over 200 successful space trips. But sadly, not all of them have actually make it to space. For instance, the Apollo 1 mission failed due to a fire in the command module, and the Challenger disaster happened because of an external tank explosion. Nevertheless, NASA has been working harder on safety so their spacecraft can safely make it into space. Satellites. A satellite is a huge camera that takes pictures of stars and galaxies millions of light years away. Even though the Hubble Space Telescope is orbiting or circling Earth, it has taken thousands, if not millions, of photos of faraway space material. Right now, NASA is building a new satellite, the James Webb Space Telescope, which has been delayed, which with the launch has been delayed many times. Its current launch date is March 30th, 2021. The universe. Are you on the edge of your seats yet? You are probably still wondering what the universe is. Well, the universe is the home of everything that exists. The universe is like the mother to all of the galaxies. Everything we see, touch, and eat is a part of the universe. Our solar system, Earth, the USA, New Hampshire, London Dairy, everything. Some people ask if there will ever be an end to the universe. Sadly, the answer to that question is most likely. As I stated earlier in my presentation, there could be a big crunch where the universe could expand so far that it starts to contract. There's a great video about the Big Crunch titled, What Will the Big Crunch Do to the Earth?, which can be found on YouTube. Multiverses. Multiverses are thought to be universes other than ours. Scientists do not even know if multiverses exist. Furthermore, multiverses could be a great escape plan just in case the Big Crunch happens. But that won't happen for another 100 billion years or so. I don't have any pictures of any multiverses, however, I do have photos to share from my trip to the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum located in Virginia. Photos. These pictures are from when I visited the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in August 2019. The picture on the right is my brother and me with the space shuttle Discovery. This picture on the right just shows how massive space shuttles are. because most people are not aware of how big they are. Conclusion. I would like con to conclude my presentation with a little review. It is believed that the Big Bang was the start of it all. To capture information about the universe, NASA launches satellites into space. Founded in 1958 by President Dwight D. Eisenhower, NASA has made 
over 200 successful space trips. Everything that exists is a part of the universe, such as water, wood, material, and metal, and other resources. Though we are familiar with our universe, it is possible that multiverses exist. Space is full of possibility and discovery. One day, maybe you could discover something extraordinary in space. Why I chose the universe. When I was little, I had a book about space, astronomy, the universe, and the universe, and I really liked it. I wanted to continue that love for the universe and learn as much as possible about it. My favorite part of my research was learning about multiverses. I like to think that there are other people from other multiverses who do not know about humans or even Earth. Thank, thank you. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Have a great time listening to the other presentations. I hope you learned something about the universe today and that I persuaded you to learn more about it. I would love to thank everyone on this slide as they helped me along the way. Shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. Norman Vincent Peale. And we'll all give you a round of applause. I'm not quite sure where she is. Oh, there she is. <laughs> nice job, Lila. All right, Miss Nora Bell. And Mrs. Ertman, we've had a few people join us since the last, since the beginning of her presentation. Okay, perfect. Yes, we, we, I, I had mentioned to just, we had to wait until the presentation was finished in order to um, let other people in. So, um, welcome everybody. If you are just joining us, uh, we just finished up Lila's presentation about the universe. And um, we are now going to be listening to Nora Bell talk to us all about therapy animals. Hello, my name is Nora Bell and my genius hour is about therapy animals. At some hospitals, there are people who are laying in their hospital beds, feeling lonely, sick, unwanted, and miserable. That's why therapy animals are important. Imagine how happy they would be if the door opened and a dog came in and leaped on their bed. Therapy animals are important because they help people lose stress and make them feel good about themselves. Are you ready to learn? Some things I'm going to cover tonight are therapy animals, various types of therapy animals, how therapy dogs are trained, and more. Although dogs are the most commonly used therapy animal, did you know many other animals can be used in therapy as well? Therapy animals are actually not service or emotional support animals. Service animals not only live with a physically impaired person, but they travel everywhere with their owner too. Emotional support animals live with a person to comfort them when they experience something that they are afraid of. An example of that would be a veteran with post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Therapy animals travel with their owners to public places to comfort and help people with illnesses, disabilities, or people with major hardships in their lives. A dog is the most common therapy animal, but there are many other types of therapy animals too, such as snakes, sheep, monkeys, ferrets, goats, hedgehogs, and many more. Not every animal can be a therapy animal. For example, you won't see a lion walking down the hospital hallway. Therapy animals have, have to have certain characteristics. They must be friendly, even-tempered, consistent, gentle, confident, comfortable meeting new people, and reliable in unusual environments. I think you know enough about what therapy animals are. Now I will share with you the training for a therapy dog. As I shared with you earlier in my presentation, animals have to, must have certain characteristics to become a therapy animal. Each therapy animal requires different training, so I'm going to focus on the training of a therapy dog. To train a therapy dog, you have to introduce your dog to new surfaces, behavior, and objects. Therapy dogs have to be used to familiar sights, sounds, and situations, such as equipment, wheelchairs, loudspeakers, fire alarms, hallways, crowds, and loud noises. Therapy dogs also have to be fine with people grabbing its tail and scruff, long hugs, yelling, and people staring into its eyes. If you want your dog to be a therapy animal and your dog is aggressive towards people or animals, shy, lacking house training skills, or has medical concerns, your dog is not fit to be a therapy animal. 
When therapy dogs are being trained, they have to go through 10 steps. The first step is to not be shy when a stranger approaches. A trainer will walk up to the dog and his handler and shake the handler's hand. The dog must show no sign or of shyness or rudeness. The second step is to teach a dog to sit or stand by the handler's side and show no show no sign of signs of shyness when people pet it. The third step is to make sure the dog is healthy. The dog will need to be a healthy weight as well as be clean, healthy, and alert. The fourth step is to teach the dog to walk on a loose leash. The dog will have to stop beside its owner and not sit when the owner stops. The dog will have to respond when the owner changes direction. The fifth step is to make sure the dog can walk through a crowd. The dog cannot show attention, interest to strangers do not pay too much attention to them. The dog must not strain on the leash or jump on people in the crowd. The sixth step is to train the dog to sit, stay, and lay down on command. The handler should be able to tell the dog to, to stay, walk away, come back, and the dog should still be in the same place, although it could be in a different position. The seventh step is to train the dog to come on command. The owner will walk 10 feet away from the dog and call the dog. The eighth step is to train the dog dog to ignore other dogs. Two handlers with their dogs will approach each other, shake hands, and continue walking for about 10 feet. The dogs should show mild interest towards each other. The ninth step is to train the dog to ignore distractions. Distractions may include someone dropping a chair, a jogger running in front of the dog, or someone dropping a cane. The dog can show little interest or in curiosity or may seem slightly startled, but the dog cannot panic. The last step is to train the dog to be all right with brief separation from its handler. The handler will give the dog's leash to someone else and leave for 13 minutes. The dog cannot whine or pace continuously or show anything more than mild nervousness. Many people think that therapy animals and service animals are the same, but they are totally different. Here are some similarities and differences between therapy animals and service animals. Therapy animals can live with with their owners. Their, Their owners could be anyone. Service animals are specifically trained to perform tasks and live with their owner to aid their disability. Service animals can go on planes and go into restaurants as long as they are with their owner. Therapy animals cannot go into public places or in public transportation. Therapy animals can help get rid of stress, depression, anxiety, and feelings of loneliness. Getting visited by a therapy animal can also help with a faster recovery of an injury or illness. Cuddling and stroking an animal can increase oxytocin and endorphins. Oxytocin is a hormone that helps raise trust and empathy while endorphins is a group of hormones in the human body that makes one feel good. Cuddling and stroking a therapy animal can also help lower blood pressure, cholesterol, and heart rate. Owning a pet can also increase physical activity. For example, caring for a dog will require walking, feeding, and playing with it. When most people think of therapy animals, they think of animals comforting people in hospitals. However, they do not think of what therapy animals do when they are not working. (laughs) Therapy animals visit hospitals most of the time, but sometimes they travel to other places as well, although they don't work every day. While therapy animals do provide therapy, they believe they're actually helping their owners instead. Therapy animals do not stay at the places they provide therapy at. Rather, they return home daily. When they are home, they are treated and loved like a normal pet. For example, if a person has a pet that is going to become a therapy animal, it is still going to be the same pet. The pet will act the same, follow the same rules, and still love its owner. I originally chose the topic therapy dogs because I love dogs and I'm interested in the study of medicine.
But when I started research on the topic, I realized that many different animals could be trained to become therapy animals. So my topic changed to therapy animals. Some more th here are some more therapy animal facts. Have you ever noticed that there's almost always a fish tank in a doctor's or dentist's office? There's a reason for that. Watching fish swim around in their tank calms people down and, and helps reduce the feelings of anxiety. People with canines or felines have a lower chance of dying from heart attack. Pets also increase social activity and exercise. Having a pet also helps decrease triglyceride levels and feelings of loneliness. Thank you for watching. I really enjoyed learning about this topic and presenting it to you. Thank you to Ms. Ertman and my peers. Give Norbell a round of applause. I don't know where you are. There you are. Great job, Norabelle. Excellent. And Miss Merrill is up next, and she is going to share with us um, her new idea for dogs. You may share your screen now, Merrill. Hi, I'm Merrill, and I've hoped you had a good day so far. Has your dog ever been anxious, or have you ever used essential oils? This is a preview of what I'll be talking about tonight. Tonight, I am excited to share my prototype with you, along with, with which essential oils are good for dogs and which ones are dangerous, thunder jackets, and more. I picked this topic because I have a dog who is afraid of loud noises and the car. Sometimes she even gets a little bit too excited. I wanted to make something that would help her yet create something that would not make her more anxious. I know how some dogs get anxious when they have something familiar on them. When I was first thinking of ideas to help Roxy, my dog, I thought of thunder jackets. I did more research and I learned more about the history of them, which I will share in my next slide. One of the most popular products for anxious dogs are thunder jackets. For those who do not know what thunder jackets are, they are a calming mechanism for dogs and cats, although they are mainly used for dogs. Although they were invented by Phil Blizzard, the idea actually came from a family friend. According to Blizzard's family, the idea was a bit far-fetched, but it worked. Before the invention, Blizzard's dog, Dozy, was afraid of thunder. However, after the product was created, she became more calm when thunderstorms occurred. Thunder jackets are very pop popular, but do they always work? Do thunder jackets actually calm dogs down? Well, after I compiled my research, they do work for the most part, according to Michelle Mullins, an animal behavior expert. Mullins stated that the problem is that the dog dog's owners think the dog is relaxed when the dog is really not. In my opinion, some dogs may get anxious when they see a thunder jacket. Since I know dogs have incredible senses of smell, I wondered if essential oils might work better. While I was researching, I found some safe, calming essential oils, but I also came across essential oils that have been proven dangerous for dogs. I will discuss the safe and calming oils first. As seen here, there are some great oils for dogs, such as lavender, ginger, rose, and chamomile. These are the most common oils used because they have a calming effect on dogs and are proven safe in other uses as well. For example, rose oil helps strengthen a dog's coat and chamomile oil can help to decrease the number of stomach spasms a dog may have. The remainder of the oils on this list are the safest and can be used for a variety of different reasons. Although some are great, some can be very dangerous. As I previously stated, some oils are very dangerous and even deadly to dogs, so watch out. Some unsafe oils for dogs are tea tree, peppermint, sweet birch, and wintergreen, to name a few. These oils should be avoided altogether to keep a dog safe 
from harm. There are many reasons these oils are not good for dogs. One of the most important reasons is that they, but breathing them, breathing in the powerful scents of the oils can cause dizziness, skin irritation, stomach issues, and more. These issues can also be caused by ingesting the oils. I will not be using these oils for my product. My prototype is a collar with a small fabric pouch that contains paper inside. Today, I have my prototype with me. The real product, however, would be a collar with a pouch filled with solidified calming essential oils and would be worn like a typical dog collar while still having a place for dog tags. This collar would be worn at all times and would especially be easy, helpful with, with leash walking and even on car rides. This is my poster board. In conclusion, this experience helped me to think about how I can help other dogs, including my own, who tend to have a great, greater anxiety while wearing something unfamiliar. More importantly, I've, I've also learned which oils could be safe and effective for my product to help dogs. Along, with, along the way, I learned that about oils that should be avoided around dogs. Also, here is my prototype. It, it's a regular collar that has a little pouch with paper inside. And this is how it would be worn on, on and it would be worn on normally on a dog. Thank you so much for listening and being a great audience. I hope you have learned something from my presentation tonight. Are there any questions? Do we have any questions for Miss Merrill? I have a question. Sure. Merrill. Mm -hmm. So did you try essential oils on Roxy? And um, how was that if you did? Yeah, we actually did. I, we did have um, essential oils around like lavender essential oils and we rubbed I rubbed it on Roxy's chest during a thunderstorm and she did seem a lot more calm during the thunderstorm than she usually is so thank you I'm learning a lot maybe I should use some lavender oil myself <laughs> lavender oil is wonderful it's a wonderful <laughs> essential oil does anybody else have any questions for Meryl I have a question Go ahead, um, Rebecca. I kind of have two questions. First okay. question, um, could you possibly make one for Frankie? Because he gets super <laughs> anxious for no reason. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't have a product yet, but maybe if I do, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, my second question mm -hmm. is a little bit more serious. But um, so sometimes... When you're at the airport, you can see that there are dogs sniffing people's stuff, like police dogs sniffing people's stuff to make sure they don't mm -hmm. have any like bad things in there. If the dog was wearing one of those collars, do you think they would be able to smell the bad stuff instead of people's bags, if that makes sense? Um, I think if they were, if they had the collar and the scent was going into them, think they would mainly smell the um, the oils because that's closer up to them. Hmm. So, thank you. And depending yeah. on the dog too, is mm -hmm. the um, the police dogs at an airport are usually trained in um, more like dangerous scents. So who knows if that could yeah. actually possibly happen or not? Yeah, I did think of that. Yeah. So who knows? Um, so Meryl, I have a question. Do you plan to try your collar at some point on Roxy? Yes, I do actually. Okay. And what, when do you think Roxy would benefit from using the collar? When? Yeah. Um, at what times? I feel like it would benefit her when we're um, in the car. She does okay. get nervous while we're in the car. Um, like also during fireworks, like like the loud booms scare right. her. Yep. And and then the last day thunderstorms, those those really scare her too. So I think it would help in those three main things. 
Fabulous. I think I, I think I need one for Buddy too. Next question. <laughs> I have a question. So, my dog, she's like, she doesn't react to getting shots, but do you think your collar would like help dogs that do react to shots like calm down? Because when my dog gets vaccines, vaccines, she doesn't, she's not even phased. <laughs> Um, I think it might, I think it would work for, for dogs at the vet. It would, it would definitely ease their, um, anxiety and if the, and like probably make them less like jittery and stuff, but yeah. Okay. Thank you. Do you, do you, th do we have any, oh, I see Colin has his hand up. Go ahead, Colin. Um, hey, Meryl, how old is Roxy? <laughs> Roxy is, um, she, she's four, I think in a half, soon, I think in a half. <laughs> oh, wait, no, she was four and a half last month. Wait, no, this month. We <laughs> <laughs> left track of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, around there. Around, around that area. <laughs> yeah. I have a question too. This is probably the last question. Are you okay. of making any cat collars? Maybe. Maybe. I feel like dogs get anxiety more than cats because, like, my with my cats, my cats are just like chilling throughout the whole time. Like anything scare, possibly scary, is happening. So. But they do make um, thunder jackets for cats, so I might make some. Maybe. Are there any more questions for Meryl? Okay, Meryl, I did see in the chat, and I agree with this person. I, I can't remember the name, but um, you need to get that prototype made so we can see you on Shark Tank. <laughs> we can all say, yeah. we know her. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, Meryl, thank you for sharing. You can um, uh, close your screen or unshare. Nice job. Round of applause. All right, Lauren, are you ready to present? Yes. Okay, next we have Lauren, and she is going to talk to us about some optical illusions. Some of the ones she has in her, um, in her presentation are pretty tricky. I just found one myself last night. Took me a while. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Lauren, and tonight I will be talking to you about optical illusions and how they affect the brain. Lauren, I'm actually going to interrupt you for a moment just because we actually are seeing your speaker notes. Oh, you can? Yes. So um, you might want to, we'll stop the recording for a quick minute. And then if you want to exit out and reshare, but make sure when you open, you open it into, you open your slide show directly from um, sharing this. Hello everybody, my name is Lauren and tonight I will be talking to you about optical illusions and how they affect the brain. Have you ever seen an illusion that tricks your eyes into believing something is moving or swaying? It's not your eyes. An illusion is proof that you don't always see what you think you do. Today I will be talking to you about the differences between optical illusions and visual illusions the visual system, eye floaters, macular degeneration disease, how we see, illusions in eyesight, illusions in art, the rice wave illusion, and why I chose the topic. I hope you enjoy. What is the difference between optical illusions and visual illusions? All images that enter through the eyes need to be interpreted through the brain, and sometimes these interpretations go wrong. A visual illusion occurs when the perception of something does not match reality. Scientists don't call them optical illusions because by definition, an optical illusion happens within the eye. A great example of an optical illusion are floaters. Floaters are small specks or shadowy shapes that seem to float in the eye. Floaters are caused by irregularities in the fluid that fills the eyes, therefore making them actually real. Most optical illusions, like the rabbit duck illusion, seen here, will be seen the same way by almost everyone who looks at it. The illusion works pretty much the same on everyone's visual system. Fun fact, 
Children tested on Easter Sunday are more likely to see the figure as a rabbit. When they are tested in October, for example, they tend to see it as a duck. It's all in the visual system. The visual cortex is the area of the brain that processes visual information. It is very thin, which between 1.5 millimeters and 2 millimeters, and is located at the back of the brain in the occipital lobe. According to Brain Made Simple, the occipital lobe is important in being able to correctly understand what the eyes are seeing. Another part of the visual system is the optic nerve. The optic nerve is a sort of cable that carries electrical pull impulses from the retina to the brain, like shown in the diagram. Along with the, topic, uh, along with the optic nerve, the visual system includes the retina, the optic the optic chiasm, the optic tract, the lateral geniculate nucleus, optic radiations, and the striate cortex. Shepherd elephant. Illusions occur when the brain attempts to perceive the future and those perceptions do not match reality. An example of this is the shepherd elephant delusion shown above, which is a figure ground impossibility. This is called the figure ground impossibility because it depicts what, what may at first glance appear to be something that could exist as a real object in the three-dimensional world. According to Roger Shepard, the, creation, the creator of this illusion. Eye floaters. Have you ever no noticed small blurry shadows in your eyes? Well, those are probably eye floaters. A clear gel called the vitreous body fills the inside of the eye. If and only if some of this clear gel forms clumps, floaters can happen. Because they are within the eye, floaters move as the eyes move. They may move away when you try to look at them. The most prominent shapes floaters appear within the eye are dots, threads, and cobwebs. These are more common occurrences as we get older. Macular degeneration. Macular degeneration also causes optical illusions. It is a problem within the eye, within the retina, and causes blurred vision. It happens when a part of the retina, called the macula, is damaged. A person with macular degeneration loses their central vision and cannot see fine details. The central vision allows us to drive cars, read, recognize faces, and see color clearly. Unfortunately, macular degeneration is very common and is the leading cause of loss of vision in people 50 years or older. How do we see? To understand how we see, the brain creates shortcuts. The brain uses shadows, perspective, and colors to make decisions about what it's seeing. For example, if the brain sees an apple, it will think of what is red and try to understand what the object is, and then rule out anything that is not red. The retina has millions of cells that are sensitive to light. The retina takes the light and changes it into nerve signals so the brain can understand what the eye How do we see? To understand how we see, the brain creates shortcuts. The brain uses shadows, perspective, and color to make decisions about what the eye is seeing. For example, if the brain sees an apple, it will think of what is red and try to understand what the object is, and then rule out anything that is not red. The retina has millions of cells that are sensitive to light. The retina takes the light and changes it into nerve signals so the brain can understand what the eye is seeing. Illusions in art. This illusion is called My Wife and My Mother-in-Law. This is a painting by William Eli Hill. There are many paintings that make one simple picture into a complicated image that will never let you see it the same way again. It's all about the details. In this case, the young woman is wearing a thin necklace. But when you look closely, the necklace turns into the old woman's mouth, and the young lady's ear turns into the old woman's eye. If the young woman had not worn the necklace, the old woman would not only have been harder to spot, but she would have no mouth. Do you see the young and old lady here? The rice wave illusion. Do you see those colorful grains of rice moving? Well, actually, they aren't moving at all. The sequence of shading causes the brain to create perception, the perception of movement. So it is just an illusion. Believe it or not, 5% of people are immune to the movement in this illusion. To conclude my presentation, 
Visual illusions happen in the visual cortex as it receives and processes the information. The light enters through the front of the eye and hits the retina, which lines the back of the eye. The image is then sent to the brain and through the optic nerve, and the brain interprets it. Optical illusions occur inside the eye. Examples are, but not limited to, flutters and blurriness caused by macular degeneration. Floaters are tiny irregularities in the fluid that allow that fills the eye, which makes the optical illusion of the floater real. Blurriness is another real optical illusion and is caused by macular degeneration. This condition damages a part of the retina called the macula and causes the loss of central vision. People suffering from this condition cannot see fine details and see lots of weary spots. The central vision is lost, but they still have their peripheral vision. An example of this would be to imagine looking at a clock with hands. A person with macular degeneration might see the clock's numbers, but not the hands. Aside from developing eye strain from staring at a screen too long, visual illusions are not harmful. Which illusion shown tonight fascinated you the most? The reason I chose this topic. I chose this topic for my genius hour because I was curious in finding out if optical illusions actually affected the brain. I've always been fascinated by optical illusions, and I often see them in normal, everyday objects. Another reason for this topic is that because I began wondering if the optical illusions were actually harmful to the brain of the eye. I wanted to find out more information about it. So, which optical illusions shown tonight fascinated you the most? Websites listed here were significant in helping me gather all my information for my presentation. Are there any questions? Thank you for watching. Are there any questions for Laura? We'll, we'll give a round of applause. <laughs> Do we have any questions for Lauren? I have a question. Yes, Norbell. Which optical illusion is your favorite? Uh, my favorite? It's either uh, my wife and my mother-in-law or the rice wave illusion. So why would they be your favorite? Well, I like the rice wave illusion because it, it, it just, every time I look at it, it's the same thing. It just moves in waves and it just fascinates me. Mm -hmm. And my wife and my mother-in-law, I think it's clever. I like it. It, <laughs> is, like very clever. it is very I clever. Like yep. That's the one that I just, I, I will admit, that's the one that I had the hardest time seeing both images. And I tech, I emailed Lauren last night. I said, oh my gosh, I finally see the older <laughs> woman in the illusion. It took me how many months, Lauren? Like a lot. <laughs> how, um, I have a question though. Have you ever seen floaters yourself in your eyes? Uh, no, not really. Okay. I think I might have a very like blurry memory of them like a long time ago, but I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And we'll hear from, um, we'll hear from Isaac. <laughs> Lots of hands up. So do your eyes hurt when you look at optical illusions? Well, my eyes don't necessarily hurt. My head might hurt. I might get dizzy. <laughs> but that's just about it. That's a good that's that's a great answer. Okay, Colin, let's hear from you. Um, hey, Lauren, have you seen um, the skull illusion before? Mm, I don't think so. Which one? Um, so there's like a picture of a skull, but... Um, like the two eyes are the heads of two girls and then it, it looks like two girls having a tea party but it also looks like a skull hmm. yeah i've seen that one before cool i'll have to look that one up myself yeah that's a that's a cool one colin yeah <laughs> meryl um so do you do sometimes optical illusions not work for you because sometimes they don't work for me the way they're intended to work for people so, yeah, sometimes, like, if you print them out and they're on paper, they don't work as well. But sometimes, like, sometimes there's a very small percent chance that people are immune. 
like I said on the slide where I was talking about the raceway movement, five percent of people are immune to the movement. So in a case where you can't see something moving, it means you're Im immune to it. Okay. But you. you might not be immune if you don't see it moving on paper. Hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And then I have a question. Did you ever see the, I think it was the blue gray dress optical illusion that was, that everybody seemed to look at last year? No, they said that you were able to see, uh, people were wondering which dress you saw. You were just saying that optical illusions sometimes don't work for you, or Meryl was saying that. Yeah. And that's one optical illusion that just did not work for me. I could not see, um, I, I could see one color, but not the other color of the dress. I don't know yeah. if anybody else knows what I'm talking about, but. There's, yeah, there's <laughs> one with. Gold and white. Yeah. Oh, it was there's one with the shoes. There's one with like yeah, shoes. <laughs> and like I could only see one color for the shoes. Yeah. And I saw like yeah. the color it actually was. I remember there was a time where everybody was talking about, have you seen this? It's so cool. And then I Googled it and I, I didn't find anything. I was like, hmm. Wow, I'm disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any more questions for Lauren in her fascinating topic tonight? All right, thank you for sharing, Lauren. You did a great job. Oh, thank you. So we get a round of applause again. Um, and last but not least, we have Miss Sarah, who is going to share with us everything she's learned about dreams. Over to you, Sarah. Go ahead and share your screen. Hello. I am Sarah, and I'm doing my Genius Hour on Dreams. I'm going to be diving into the science and questions you may have about them. As you can see, I'm going to be speaking to you about various subjects inside of the topic of dreams. Now, I think it is time to start a conversation about dreams, head into their diversity, science, and everything about our wonderful, mysterious, scary, and vivid dreams. I chose this topic because dreams interest me, and I know that there are so many facts that have yet to be determined. These wacky, strange, inspiring, and sometimes life-changing illusions make me very interested in, in the topic of dreams. Scientists have stated different hypotheses for the question, why do we have dreams? According to DreamingPsychologyToday.com, there are some such as memory consolidation and emotional regulation. The unconscious mind is said to be a reason why as well. Another reason for having certain dreams may be due to feelings we have experienced in different situations. Memories in the mind can also be another possible reason for having dreams. Now, let's change the subject. Are dreams something we really need to have? Well, the question cannot truly be answered. Scientists have performed various tests on this subject. One test includes waking people during REM sleep and asking if they remember dreaming. Still, some recorded that they did not. Therefore, scientists are unable to determine whether or not test subjects are telling the truth about having dreams. Scientists have concluded that dreams do have health benefits though, including emotional regulation, meaning how one will feel the next day after a dream. Remember when I mentioned REM sleep? REM sleep is a stage of sleep when the brain is most active. During this stage of sleep, eyes move rapidly back and forth. Humans are most likely to remember dreams from REM sleep because of how active the brain is. This is the reason scientists wake subjects up during this time while performing studies about dreams, because humans can easily be woken up during REM sleep. Did you know that there are so many types of dreams humans can have? One of the many being lucid dreams? Ah, uh, yes, lucid dreams. In a lucid dream, the dreamer has the ability to control things within the dream itself. Scenes, characters, and narratives are the things a dreamer may be able to control while dreaming. 
People can teach themselves how to have lucid dreams. One such way to do this is for a person to ask the question, am I dreaming, frequently throughout the day. This teaches the brain to acknowledge the fact that the individual is actually dreaming. I have had lucid dreams myself and wish I could have more. But are all dreams what you want or could some scare you? Nightmares. Although nightmares often occur more with children, less than 10% of adults report frequent nightmares as well. Often mistake, mistaken for night terrors, nightmares are not the same thing. Some characteristics of nightmares include screaming and running out of bed, whereas night terrors cause the sleeper to scream and have similar reactions to panic attacks. Night terrors are often not remembered the next day, but most nightmares are. Nightmares can cause the dreamer to feel stressed and scared. To conclude my presentation, dreams may be had for several reasons, such as reacting to feelings that the dreamer has experienced during it today. As of today, it is not known if everybody has dreams, though scientists predict that it will be proven in the future through advanced technology. People are most likely to remember dreams from REM sleep because of how active the brain is during this time. Though lucid dreams and nightmares are very different, they both can occur during REM sleep. Lucid dreams are dreams where the dreamer can control what happens. However, nightmares are frightening dreams that occur To conclude my presentation, dreams may be had for several reasons, such as reacting to feelings that the dreamer experienced during the day. As of today, it is not known if everybody has dreams, though scientists predict it will be proven in the future through advanced technology. People are most likely to remember rem dreams from REM sleep because of how active the brain is during this time. Though lucid dreams and nightmares are very different, they both can occur during REM sleep. Lucid dreams are dreams where the dreamer can control what happens. However, nightmares are frightening dreams that occur mostly in children as opposed to adults. As you can see, the subject of dreams is quite diverse. Dreams have many unique aspects, yet there's so much more to discover. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you all for listening and have a good night. Do you have any questions? Meryl has a question. Okay. So you say you've had um, lucid dreams. C could you tell us one thing that happened during a lucid dream if you remember? I have had lucid dreams where my brain picks a random setting, but I get to control other things. Like once I remember when I was younger, I had this show I used to watch. I forget what it was, but it brought me to like this place in that show. And I went on, the, on an adventure with the characters. Sounds really Thank you. awesome. Oh, we have lots of questions. Lauren. Are lucid dreams like always good dreams or sometimes they're like, like a bad setting and some like, can they be bad or nightmares in a way? I believe most of the time they are nice dreams that people enjoy. Okay, and Isaac? <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you ever had dreams that's like, where it goes from scary to good? None that I remember. I remember one. <laughs> <laughs> and Lila? Oh, Lila, we're, hold on just a second, Lila. You might have to repeat your question. We didn't hear the first part of it. Okay. 
So I know that there are some dreams that you can't control because I've had some. What are those called? Um, there's several. It's, um, you could have nightmares that you definitely can't control. And there's other dreams as well. Yeah, I recall that there are many different types of dreams. And within this one, we focused on the lucid dreams. But there are, um, from a genius hour or from a key presentation last year, I do recall that there are other dreams out there. Um, I cannot remember off the top of my head what, the, what, they're, what they're called. Mm -hmm. Nora Bell. So I had a dream when I was Meryl Cat. Would that be a lucid dream? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Were you able to control things in it? Good question. Nora Bell, you're frozen. Um, were you able to control um, anything within that dream? I don't remember <laughs> being able to. <laughs> then most likely not. <laughs> right. And I, do we have other questions? I guess I wasn't able to. <laughs> Maybe some parts you're able to control. Okay, uh, Rebecca, I saw your hand up. So um, this is gonna be a very compli complicated question. And I'm sorry, but I'm very curious. So wait, who was it? Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney, <laughs> he had a dream of his mother coming in his sleep when he was having a fight, like all the Beatles were having a fight. And he had a dream that his mom was telling him that it is okay. And he made a song about that. Let it be. <laughs> I don't know if you can answer that, but like. That, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> that a real dream. People dream about it. Sounds lucid. <laughs> It does, it does sound a little lucid to me, a little lucid dream for Paul McCartney. <laughs> it, was, it was the 60s, I'll just say that. <laughs> Colin, I see your hand over there, bud. Um, can you, um, like, choose the setting of your dream, but then you can't control your actual dream? I don't know how that would work. I'm sure you can. We'll try tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and are there any more questions for Sarah? And are there any more questions for any of our other pres uh, presenters from this evening? All right. Well, my friends, you made me so proud. I had to almost like hold back the tears. I'm so proud of you. You guys did a fabulous, or I'm sorry, you ladies did a fabulous job presenting tonight especially um, helping Mrs. Thompson and I out on our, our first go around with uh, a Zoom key showcase. Never thought I'd have to do that, but thank you very much, ladies. And I appreciate everybody in the audience for attending and making it special for them. Um, we will be, uh, the recordings will be sent over to um, Mr. Bollier. He is one of our, he's the video specialist uh, for the district. And once that's all pieced together, I will um, send out that link to all the families and you can rewatch the presentations. All right. Thank you for joining everybody. Great job. Good job, everyone. Excellent job, friends. Great job. Excellent job. Really proud of all of you. And I appreciate your patience um, in waiting to get on tonight. I, I it was we had to make sure our, our ladies were all set um, to get their presentations going. So I appreciate that.
Well done. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Thanks thank for you. putting in the hard work to make it happen. Oh, yes. All my ladies did a great job. Actually, all of the students did a fabulous job. I'm so proud of all of them this year. So I wish that I, I'm excited to be able to share the link with everybody so that everybody is going to be able to share to, to see everybody else's presentations. Yes. So good work. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you. Awesome job. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Miss you, you all. I, yes, hopefully we'll see you in the fall. No, I won't see yes, you in the fall. Will. Don't have them. Girls, don't say that. <laughs> no, I mean, You're even if you're not in school, I won't see you in the fall because you'll be at middle school. Oh. That's what I mean. Oh, you are going to have to come back and visit me. I'll make a visit on the way. You better. <laughs> Yeah, you better. <laughs> you had better. Although I do see Rebecca a, a few times, so. What? I see you sometimes. <laughs> Every once in a while. All right. Every once in a while. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.